morning. Welcome to church on this uh, non-freezing day, but uh, you know, it might be raining, but at least it's not negative four outside. But this is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice, and we will be glad in it today. So welcome to church. A couple announcements I want to bring to your attention uh, before we jump into worship here. Uh, one, uh, of course, Easter's around the corner, and they need pre-wrapped little candies. Uh, lots of them. Uh, they always go through a ton of these. So uh, if you happen to be at uh, Walmart or Giant Eagle, Shop at Save, anything, if you could pr uh, pick up a bag, and you don't need to buy 10 bags, if you just pick up one bag uh, and take it down to the office at some point in time so they can get those wrapped. So uh, please pray about that and uh, consider a uh, donation of that. Also coming up is uh, the Buckets, the Sunday school class, I believe, am I on the right? Lorraine, you're shaking your head. But not Buckets. Health kit, sorry. I missed that. I just pre-assumed those buckets. Um, in the bulletins, they're looking at health kits to donate. Uh, you don't need to purchase anything, just what's on the list. Um, so if you consider doing this, um, if you have any questions on this, please talk to Lorraine about it. She is kind of the front on that. Big one coming up, and this one is so super, it's soup-er. Woohoo. So if you have any kind of skills at making soup, I love soup. Okay, I absolutely love soup. So please do on the March 13th. This is a very, very important day because this is my birthday. So you all need to come out and buy soup. So if you're able to do this, there's containers up here to the left before you leave. Please only take so many quarts um, if, you can, uh, if you're able to uh, make soup and donate for that. Please uh, only take what you can fill. But uh, please come out that day. There will be lunch provided. You can purchase soups. Uh, this isn't something uh, new. We've done this kind of in the past. Um, it's very successful. There's always there's some amazing soup makers out there. I, I always try to get a couple, and they're just absolutely amazing. So please uh, uh, pray on this. Come on out that day. Invite a friend, and uh, it'll be just a wonderful time. And again, if you have any questions, talk to Lorraine over there. She is the front on this. So if there is uh, no other announcements, I ask us just to bow our heads and have a moment of prayer. Dear Lord, as uh, we come to you in prayer this morning, as we are all gathered in this, in, in your building, in your wonderful home, Lord, just ask us to uh, lift our eyes towards you and our voices for our songs we are going to sing and just be a time of worship and praise for you, Lord. And in your holy and sweet name, amen. Please stand.
Lift up your eyes, people of God. We look to the hills. We stare into the desert. We gaze at the horizon. Where is our help? Our help is from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. You may be seated. Lord, we come to you in prayer this morning. We come to you in all different times of our life, different aspects. But God, before all that, God, we want to be thankful. We want to be thankful for everything that's around us. It's easy for us to get caught up and say, I don't have this. And if this was just going right in my life, then, then everything would be okay. But God, first, let's help us open our eyes. And let's be grateful first about the blessings that are all around us. And they come from you. Because all good things come from you, Lord, and thank you for that. Lord, we are on this journey of Lent right now. This adventure, this, this time time that we should be growing closer to you and, and talking more and spending more time maybe with you. 
Lord, first help us with that, if, if that's something we struggle with. But God, as we journey closer every day, taking a step closer to that cross, as, as you did so many years ago, every day was a step closer for you. Lord, let us every day follow you. As you first told those first men there on that boat, you said, drop everything. Just come with me. God, let us do that also because you're always knocking at the door. You're always knocking there. The invitation is there. And you say, follow me. But too often we hang on to, to whatever's tying us down. God, help us put that down and just turn towards you and just say, I'm willing, Lord, that we are all in for this. So, God, let us just continue to always look towards you for guidance. Because, Lord, what you did on that cross so many years ago, what you, what you did, you hung on there. You died for us. You stepped off that throne, your throne, and he came to us. Nothing we could do to get to you, but you came to us because of that love you have for us and that grace and mercy that you give to us each and every day that sometimes we just don't realize how awesome that grace and mercy is, that grace that is given to us freely. We don't have to ask for it. We don't have to pay for it. We don't have to do something for it. It is given to us freely. Thank you, Lord, for that because we don't deserve it. Because we are sinners. We are not people that are wrongdoers. We don't make mistakes. We are sinners. And we sin against you. So often daily. So Lord, thank you for that grace and mercy that you did. And you hung on that cross because you love us. And you care for us. And you walked out of that grave so we no longer have to fear death. That the victory has already been won. Thank you, Lord, and praise you for that. Lord, so often prayer, what we're doing right now, we do not talk to you enough. God, help us with that. Put a peace in our heart, a still in our heart. To stop worrying about what needs done all the time, about saying this needs to be done, that needs to be done, before we get to you. Let's stop it, but you first. Because who knows what the rest of the day could bring, but starting our day with you in prayer. Every, always look to you, trust in you. Stop putting you in the back seat and say, God, I'll call on you when I need you. God, we need to put you first. Help us with that. Put our pride aside that it's not always about us. Because you hate our pride, God. You really do. God, help us with prayer to go to you first and say, Lord, help me with this situation. Lord, what should I decide here? Lord, help me with my sin. And trust in you that you will always be there to take care of us because you are faithful to us. You're always there teaching us, showing us. Lord, we pray for everyone out there that is the, the sickness and illness, that we, we have this vaccine that's going on and, and the COVID and everything like that. And, and that seems to take the front. But there's a lot of people out there. There's still a lot of sickness. God, we want to pray for those. People that are, are ill and sick and not feeling well. And we ask that you to just touch them and heal them. And, and most of all, God, have your spirit there with them. Not only with the, it's with us today, but with them also. That they can have a peace in their heart. And God, help us with that love. It's easy to hate. It's hard to love. It is so hard sometimes to love. But God, you did it for us, and we want to do it also. So let us always show that love. Let us speak that love and speak of your name as we go and talk to people every day and just have a light inside of us burning so bright that maybe we don't even have to say something. People just ask, what is different about you? So God, help us turn up that, that flame on us. That the light shines brighter than any darkness that can ever be. 
Lord, thank you again for everything that's around us and all the blessings that you have given us. And we are very thankful. And Lord, as we continue to pray this morning, as you taught those disciples to pray so many years ago, saying, Our Father, Lord, Lord, Good morning. good morning. It's so good to be with you. I want you to know I just look forward to the time we have to share. And, and uh, I, I think that our Sunday mornings go, uh, go way too quickly. I wish we had more time uh, to, to spend together in, in fellowship. You know, I was, I was remembering a time uh, many years ago when I went, um, uh, I went bird hunting with my cousin, and um, he had, uh, at that time, he had these, uh, these bird dogs, and we went to this um, hunting pr- preserve type place, and they took us out to this place where there were these, uh, you know, different kinds of birds that we we're hunting. So I'm walking across this field, and, and for those of you who haven't hunted that way, uh, the hunters walk in a line, and they kind of walk along, and, and the dogs are running back and forth uh, to, to find the game. And uh, this, the dog, uh, the way this one was trained is when, when the dog found out where a bird was, sniffed it out or whatever they do, I don't know, uh, he, would, he would point, you know, and the dog would just, would stand and, uh, no, I'm not going to do it, Jeff, okay? The, the, do- the dog would snout point right to, wh- right to where the, uh, the bird is. So, so we're walking across and the dog is running back and forth and the dog runs across in front of me and it skids to a stop and turns its head and looks right in front of me. And I, I'm saying, okay, get, you know, get ready, guys. And so I start moving up, and the dog just keeps, keeps looking and looking. And then, do you ever have an animal give you a look of utter disgust? 
looks up at me, it's like, well, you dummy, where? I said, I don't know where it is. And I moved my foot, and the bird was right there. Right in front of me. You know, scared the stuffing out of me as it went away. And I, and I remembered that. When we have, we have two chickens at home in, in a chicken palace, all right, at our house, and there's a fence around it and everything. And um, by the way, if you ever raise chickens to get eggs to save money, the cost per egg is unbelievable, okay? I figured it out, right? You know that, right, Lorraine? Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm feeding the chickens at one morning, and I just sort of hear this sound behind me, and I turn around, and I see a rabbit running away. And the next morning, the same thing happens, and then um, I missed him the third morning, but I looked over, and he's still right there. He was getting used to me. And, and I told Carla and Shane... Uh, yesterday, where, where the rabbit was, and I said, look, there's a rabbit. He just sits right underneath. And it's just a little, little bit of brush. And they walked over, and doing, they couldn't even see it. Many times there are things right under our nose that we don't see. There are times that you and I have raised things in our lives to the place where they are idols in our life. And we haven't even noticed because we've become so used to it or we miss it. Last week, we looked at this guy, the rich young ruler, and we saw that he had everything, but but he had nothing. He had it all, but he did not understand what must be of, of first importance, and because he wasn't willing to make the choices that were necessary to, to place Jesus at first importance in his life, uh, he, he went away sad, and Jesus was sad about that, about that as well. Well, Today we're going to look at a story in, uh, in, the, in the book of Genesis, and, and it's sort of uh, the antithesis of the rich young ruler. You see, the rich young ruler, he thought that what he had in his hands, what he possessed, was better than what Jesus was offering to him. The book of Genesis, you remember Adam and Eve in the garden, you remember all of that, and things were great, and then the fall came into the picture, and, and, the, and they fell away from grace, and then... Uh, God provided him away, and then evil got so bad that God sent the flood. You remember that? And, and then God delivered the people through, through a guy named what? Who? Noah. Yeah, yeah, Noah's Ark. You remember that story. And, uh, and then uh, the flood waters uh, receded, and then uh, humanity continued to grow in size. And, and if you read the book of Genesis, you go back to Genesis chapter 12, there's this guy named Abram. And God called Abram and said, Abram, I want you to follow me. I'm I'm summarizing very quickly a couple of chapters of Genesis. He says, follow me and Abraham through through you. All the nations of the earth will be blessed. I'll I'll bless you, Abram. I'll make you a great nation. I'm going to bless all the peoples of the world through you. Well, Abraham obeyed and followed him. And and God began that, uh, that whole that whole process. And so it's a series of stories of how Abram uh, continued to obey God, and he became known as Abraham. And uh, Abraham and his wife Sarah, they didn't have any kids, and God promised them that he would send a child of promise. And it was very important in that day and time, if God's going to bless and build a great nation, that means that they had to have kids. You know, that's a short story. Well, they weren't having any. And so we come to this story in Genesis chapter 22, and and where we are is eventually Isaac, the child of promise, was born. You know, Sarah and Abraham, they couldn't have any kids, but God promised, said they would, and so so they did, and God fulfilled his promise, and, and you could see that God was beginning to bless through them, and Abraham and Sarah, this was just, you know, this was just so, so great, and then this happens, Genesis 22. Sometime later, now understand, the sometime later, I don't know exactly how long that was, but one sometime later that I want you to know is from the time that God told Abraham and Sarah that they would have Isaac until they had Isaac, the child of promise, was about 75 years. You think you've been waiting on God a long time? 75 years, God had promised. 
God delivered. And there's another lesson for a message in another day. It's very often God's promises to you and me don't come on our timetable. They come on God's timetable. Well, it says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son. Remember that phrase. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Are you kidding me? God, what are you doing? All this time, we've gone through all of this for you. I left my land and my country, and I went to the land that you said you would show me, and you did, and you promised that this kid would come, and it was 75 years, and all of a sudden, he, he now is, is here, and he's starting to grow up, and now, how could a loving Heavenly Father even suggest such a thing? Take your son, your only son, can you hear echoes of Gethsemane here? Can you hear them? Take your only son. You see, I think God knew exactly what he was asking Abraham to do. I don't think it's a typo that emphasize, when it emphasizes your only son. You know, if you grew up between 1963 and 1997, you probably heard a message a lot of times, quote, this is a test. For the next 60 seconds, this station will conduct a test of the... This is... Yeah, you heard it too, okay. God never intended for Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. But it was a test. And Abraham was willing to obey even... Was, was Abraham willing to obey even the most crazy request from God? Well, the story goes on. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he, uh, when he had uh, cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. I can only imagine what happened between verse 2 and verse 3. I wonder if Abraham was, was up all night. I, I know I probably would have been questioning wondering, filled with uncertainty, asking himself the question, you know, why, you know, why is this happening? What's going on? I imagine he's dealing with heartache. He's dealing with fear. You know, we may never know exactly what's going through his mind, but we do know what he did. He got about obeying God. You know, he filled the tank with gas. He packed some sandwiches and a suitcase. He loaded up Isaac and a couple of people to help his servants, and they took off. On the third day, it says, Abraham looked up and saw a place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boys go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt, oh, by the way, can you hear the faith in that sentence? We will worship. And he didn't say, then I will come back to you. He said, what? Then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the knife, or carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. God will provide the lamb for the offering. Lambs have always been incredible offerings to God. Simplicity, their innocence, their purity. And here again is the echoes of Gethsemane. The echoes of Golgotha. 
You see, remember the gospel, that because of my sin, because of your sin, you and I, we were separated from God. Because of the things that we have thought, said, and done, there was a chasm between, uh, between all of us and between God. And then the God of the universe humbled himself, and he became human, and he came to earth in Jesus Christ, and he went through all the trials and tribulations and hassles that you and I have to deal with. And then he allowed himself to be falsely accused, to be put on a cross and crucified. This is the God who created it all, and then he came off that, he he could have come off that cross in just a second, but he didn't. He chose to stay. As that old saying goes, the nails didn't hold Jesus there. His love for you held him there on the cross. He stayed there to pay for your sin and for mine and anybody else who will accept his sacrifice so that we don't have to pay for our sins, so that all of our past can be forgiven, that we don't have to go to to hell and be separated from him forever. And, and, And because God has paid for all the things that you and I have ever done wrong or thought or thought wrong or said wrong. And not only did God pay the penalty for the sins of our past, he came to give us a purpose in the future, a purpose in the present and a plan for our future. And God said, I'll get to know you and and you can get to know me and and I will have a personal relationship with you and, and you can learn to love me as much as I love you. That's what God says to us. And then he says, not only have I paid for your ticket, but to heaven by dying on the cross for you, you trust in me and you will live with me forever in heaven. Acts 15 says, we were saved because Jesus, out of sheer generosity, moved to save us. The reason that you and I can even think about approaching heaven is because of the generosity of God for us. God sent a Savior to serve as a sacrifice that would pay the price for my sin and your sin to provide us a way back. John the Baptist, he was the one in the New Testament who prepared the way for Jesus. He announced that the light of the world was coming. And and he said in John uh, chapter 1 verse 23, he said, make straight the way for the Lord. John knew that his role was to announce the coming Messiah, was to announce that Jesus was coming. And, And he understood that Jesus would increase and then John would decrease. And John did what he was supposed to do. He prepared the way. Then one day it says... John saw Jesus coming toward him and says, said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Remember what Abraham said? God will provide the Lamb. You see, sometimes I think that we see the, we see the Bible as being disconnected. But it's the same message from beginning to end of a God who so loved you and me that has been in constant pursuit of us as we are running away from him. And in case you missed it, the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. Then he saw Jesus passing by. He said, look, the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. John the Baptist has been preparing for the Messiah. God knew and wanted you and I to understand that he wouldn't ask Abraham to do anything that he himself wasn't willing to do. When they reached a place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac, laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Now, you know, I have always wondered at this point in the story, what what was Isaac thinking? What's going through his mind? You know, I might have expected a huge wrestling match to break out between Isaac and Abraham. I don't know about you. I, I, I love my dad, and, and, and I love him more and more and, and as, we, as we age together. And, but about the time he lays hands on me and wants to tie me up and put me on top of wood where he's going to start a fire, we would have a problem. Anybody with me? We don't read about that between Isaac at this time. Maybe the words, God will provide the lamb, 
Maybe God was doing something in Isaac at the same time. Now, anybody who thinks that the Bible is boring has not read this story. The knife is in the air. Abraham is ready to obey God even to the most insane, what what would seem to be insane request. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. You hear it again? There's a phrase again, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over, he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. You see, a substitutionary sacrifice. That's what Jesus was for us. He was my substitute and yours. Don't ever think that our sin goes unpunished. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, there it is again, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And as the sand on the seashore, your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. This is only a test. Remember? And Abraham passed the test. I, I don't know if you've noticed, but life is just a series of tests. Amen? One right after another, after another. Uh, Now, now don't over-spiritualize this yet. Okay, we're tested in everything. You remember in school, in every class, there's some sort of a test. You know, there's some sort of an exam, a quiz, or whatever. And usually what I've noticed is, as you go through the year, the tests don't get easier. They get what? They get harder because there's more information. You have to remember what you remembered before, and you have to remember what you forgot, and then you have to remember what you were supposed to have learned. And it it builds on itself, and and it grows. And, and, And we're supposed to know more and more material, and we're supposed to grow past the initial lessons of that subject in order to get to the harder ones. Our jobs are just a series of tests as well, aren't they? You know, very often, you you learn something, you learn some skill, some ability, and then you're challenged to take it further. You're challenged to learn more, or you're challenged to to do that skill that you have acquired. You're you're challenged to do it quicker, more efficiently. Uh, For whatever reason, you start a sport. You learn the basics, and then you go through a series of trials and tests, and your skills are stretched. It is through testing that we grow. It's the same way in our spiritual lives. Remember the parable of the talents in the New Testament? The master goes away and he gives one servant five talents. He gives the other servant how many? Two talents, and he gives the other servant one talent. And he goes away, and then he comes back, and, you know, this, this is a test. And when he returns, the one who had five talents turned that into ten. The one that had two talents turns it into four. Uh, they, had, they had passed the test. And he says this in Matthew 25, the exact same reward to both the five-talent guy and the two-talent guy. He said, the master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Passing the tests led to even greater opportunities and then more tests. As the tests increase in complexity and difficulty, so do the rewards. Remember when the test was hard and, and uh, you got an A? Now, and I don't know how your schooling was, but you know, I didn't get an A on every class, <laughs> every test. <laughs> Anybody with me? And so when I did, guess what? Man, that felt great. You know, the fact that I had succeeded, you know, you can take on the world, and especially when it was an exceedingly hard test, and I realized that, that I had put in the work, and I had studied, and I got the, the results for, for that. That's what God wants for you and me in our spiritual journey. 
It's only through tests that you and I will get a testimony. It's only through the tests that you and I will understand who God is and what God wants to do in our lives. But why is it so often we think that tests mean that we're doing something wrong? No, the presence of tests in your life spiritually may be an an indication that you are walking the journey that God wants you to walk. No test, no testimony. Now, I dare say most of us here will never be tested the way that Abraham was. But we will be tested. So recognize it for what it is. It's an opportunity for you to grow. Tests of our faith from God do two things. First, it's an opportunity for God to prove himself to us. And second, it's our opportunity to prove ourselves to God. That's why the scripture says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You see, the tests of our lives are proving grounds. It's how we graduate to the next level in our faith journey. When Abraham raised the knife, God knew that Abraham was all in because he was willing to sacrifice his son, his only son. And God proved himself as the great provider. God provided that ram in the wilderness. And if Abraham had not gone all in, he would have robbed God of the opportunity to prove God's faithfulness to Abraham. In his book, Mark Batterson writes, God cannot reveal his faithfulness until we exercise our faith. You see, following Jesus is not just a one-time thing. It's not just a one-time decision. It's not just a one-time obedience that you and I can you know, make that decision and then coast for the rest of our lives. Following Jesus is a long obedience. And we have to recognize and expect that there will be multiple times where we are tested as to whether we will follow or whether we won't follow. You see, often you and I have to choose to follow Jesus into the unknown into the uncomfortable, into new lands, into new situations, into new relationships, into new ministries, into new challenges. And I want you to notice, Abraham was old. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you consider yourself old, okay? Sometimes I think we think that God only works in the minds and the lives of the young. Yes, God does work there. But as long as you're breathing, God's not done. God has more for you. And for many in this room, you may have retired from your life's work, but you never retire from being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And you never retire from God wanting to do more in your life. You see, the years you have now may be precisely what God has been preparing you for all of your life, if you will obey. The world has yet to see what God will do with and for and through and in and by the man who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. Matthew 4, 19, Jesus said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. There is no age restrict." restriction. There's no age requirement. And I want you to remember, those of us who are advancing in years, younger people are watching you. Younger people are watching you. And if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you and I have a responsibility to live that out before people who are younger. Isaac was watching everything that Abraham did. Isaac, I think, learned a tremendous lesson from both his dad and his God. So here it is. What is your Isaac? 
Who is your Isaac? See, God will never tempt you to do evil. He will never, ever tempt you to do evil. That's not his nature. Uh, he, uh, and, and when we are faced with temptation, God has promised that he will always provide us an escape route. Always. So those times when you and I have said, well, we just had to give in to temptation, that's not from God. You know, that, that's, that, that is from us. God will never tempt you to do evil. But I can promise you this, God will test your faith. And the tests probably won't get easier. They probably will get harder. Because you see, God sees something in you that I bet you don't even see in you. And God wants to draw that out. And it's through the tests that you and I will become stronger. The stakes will get higher and the tests will often revolve around what is most important to you. Where do you get your identity? Where do you place your security? That is your Isaac. God will test you to make sure that your identity and your security are found in nowhere else but Jesus. You see, if you recall, God will test you and me to reveal anything that you and I trust in more than Jesus until we put it on the altar. You see, God gave Isaac to Abraham, and God has given you great skills and great gifts and great, great abilities, but when, if the gifts and if the, those talents and abilities ever become more important than the giver, the very thing that God has blessed our lives with can undermine God's purposes in our lives. Whenever you and I begin pursuing the gifts, begin pursuing the blessings, more than we pursue the one who has given us the gifts and given us the blessings, then that very thing can undermine our spiritual journey and our spiritual growth. Anything that is ahead of our desire for Jesus, if, it ever pass, if our love for those things ever pass our love for Jesus, then it's the beginning of the end for us. And oftentimes, those are good things. I'm not saying it's bad things. Sometimes the idols of our lives are, 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 are good things. You see, we forget something sometimes is that none of it is ours anything. We really shouldn't say my house, my car, my job. God has given it to us. Everything that you and I have is a byproduct of our time, talent, skill, ability that God has given to us. We forget what Galatians 2.20 says. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me and the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, as a disciple of Jesus, this is not my life. It's his. If you call yourself a disciple of Jesus, it's not your life. It's his. We lose our life in his. Now, the harder that you and I have to work for something, the harder it is to give it back. The longer we have to wait for a promise, the tougher it is to give back. Isaac was the lifelong dream of a barren woman named Sarah and her husband Abraham. And as I already told you, the time between when the promise was given and when it was fulfilled was 75 years. You see, the more that God blesses you, the harder it is going to be for you and me to keep the blessing from becoming an idol in your life. Our, our money, our financial security is perhaps a, a very good example for us. The more that we have, the harder it is to trust Almighty God with the Almighty dollar. Isn't it ironic that we have in God we trust printed on the very thing that we find most difficult to trust Him for? Isn't that ironic? You see, God blesses you and me financially so we can be a blessing to others. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't prepare for retirement or children's education or, or care for aging parents or provide for our family's well-being, but that doesn't change the fact that if you and I are not willing to give it all away, if God asks us to, it is an idol for us. It's an idol for us. You see, your Isaac... Your Isaac Maybe your job, it may be your career, it may be your kids, it may be your spouse. You say, oh, what, do you, what do you mean, Chris? I, let me be clear. We need to love our spouse and our kids more than anything else in this world, but not more than Jesus, period. 
If we do, we make an idol of them. Now, Carla is a wonderful wife, and I love her dearly. And Shane is an awesome son, but they make lousy idols. They're lousy gods. They are fantastic as long as I keep the priorities where they need to be. Jesus first, then my spouse, then my kids. What's your Isaac? Your Isaac could be golf, could be your hobby, could be your pets, travel, sports. I could go on and on. Anything that you have in your life ahead of Jesus, that just might be your idol. We shared this the first Sunday in January. We shared this prayer. We said, I am no longer my own but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for thee or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty, let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine, so be it. And the covenant which I made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. See, Whatever your Isaac is, this is a test. Will you place that on the altar? Then and only then can you see what God will really do in your life. Jesus, thank you for your incredible sacrifice for us, and thank you for Abraham's example of faithfulness and obedience to you. God, I can only imagine how difficult that must have been for him. But I thank you for his faithfulness and his example for us. Give us, God, the same courage and strength. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Well, as you go, you know what's ahead for you this week, don't you? 
There's a test, or two, or three. Those are an opportunity for God to prove his faithfulness to you and for you to prove your faithfulness to him. So go now and don't be surprised when they come, but thank God for a chance for him to show more of his goodness to you. Go and live in love in his name, and may he fill you with his peace. Amen.